call to the March session of the 2020-2021 Lunch and Learn series. And before we begin, I just want to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Today's session will begin with a presentation from our speaker and we'll conclude with about 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A. After the presentation, we'll take those questions. To submit a question, even during the presentation, please use the question and answer chat function on your screen. And once you finish typing your question, don't forget to hit send so we can see it. I'm sure many of us are familiar with the concept of the lunch and learn, where faculty members come together during their lunch hour to share with one another projects they are working on and to dialogue and discuss methodologies, successes and challenges they encountered in their work. This webinar series is intended to serve as inspiration and a networking opportunity for participants while recreating the collegial field of the lunch and learn. In this sixth and final session of the 2021 series, we will hear from Dr. David Wright, Associate Professor, Faculty of Health Sciences of the University of Ottawa. David Wright is a registered nurse who has spent his entire career in palliative care. He is currently Associate Professor at the University of Ottawa School of Nursing and Academic Lead for Palliative Care and Nursing Ethics within the Centre for Research on Health and Nursing at the University of Ottawa. Throughout his academic trajectory, David has worked clinically as a bedside nurse. Firstly, for several years on the palliative care unit of a large university teaching hospital, and more recently within residential hospice. Since 2012, he has held specialty certification in hospice palliative care nursing from the Canadian Nurses Association. David is most passionate about how knowledge for healthcare practice develops through the stories that people tell about their lives and about the stories that providers tell about their work. In today's session, titled Supporting At-Risk Populations, Narrative, Diversity, and Grief in Nursing and Nursing Education, Dr. Wright will share some stories from people who might be considered at risk in the context of COVID-19 and encourage us to think about how such stories can strengthen the ethics of our teaching and our nursing practice. To hear more, I'll now turn the session over to our presenter so we can begin. Dr. Wright. Thank you uh, so much for that introduction and for having uh, me uh, here with you today. Uh, welcome to everybody. Um, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am living and working on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. And if I may, because uh, I know that people are joining us from a variety of places, I'll invite everyone on this call to take a moment to consider the territory that you're joining from. And particularly if you are not Indigenous, uh, to reflect on the privilege that you hold in being able to occupy the land that you do. So here we are in March 2021, and I want to highlight two noteworthy things that happened just in the past week. So first, it was this week uh, on March 11th, 2020, that the World Health Organization declared a COVID pandemic. Uh, that declaration came a couple of days after a man in his 80s died at the Lynn Valley Center in North Vancouver, becoming Canada's first recorded death from COVID-19. And as we all know, there has been so much death since. Um, a second thing that happened this week, uh, this time in 2021, is the Catholic Church decreed that it will not bless same-sex unions. Its rationale is that while gay people should be treated with dignity and respect, the church cannot condone the illicit act of homosexual sex, which apparently is a sin against God. So these two, these two events might seem unrelated, but as we move through this talk, I'm hoping uh, to encourage you to see that there are actually some connections between the two that we can make. So today's talk is about a few different things, uh, but first and foremost, it's about grief. And so before we begin, and in acknowledgement that we are now one full year into this thing called COVID-19, I'd like everyone on this call to take a moment and think about something that you have lost or are grieving since the pandemic began. And I want to invite you, if it feels comfortable, to hold on to these thoughts as we move through the next hour together.
So um, as Linda mentioned in her introduction, uh, I'm a fan of stories. And so um, I'd like to begin by telling two. The first comes from the Canadian news media. So this is Brian Barnes and his wife, Joanne. Joanne lived across the street from Brian in a long-term care facility in Barrie, Ontario. When the pandemic struck, Brian could not visit with his wife. On March 16th, uh, 2020, so one year ago yesterday, he wrote her a letter uh, to accompany some flowers because he could not find an appropriate greeting card at the local store. This led to him proceeding to write more than 300 letters to her over the course of the pandemic. Here is a quote from one of these letters. If you only remember one thing, remember that I love you very much for over 48 years now. I miss you, I miss seeing you, and I give you as much love as always. The letters that Brian wrote were about different things, sometimes just about whatever was happening that day, other times about memories and intimate details of their life together. On Christmas, for example, Brian wrote a letter recounting the story of their son's birth. This was letter number 92, and it's actually the letter that's pictured on the slide. Because he was barred from being able to see his wife, Brian would hand deliver these letters to long-term care staff members, so PSWs and nurses, who would then read the letters aloud to Joanne. Sometimes she would ask to hold the letter as she settled into bed for the night, and staff would report back to Brian that she would sleep through the night holding the letter against her chest. Brian would also encourage staff to read the letters on their own. He did not consider them to be private. One of the PSWs in a conversation about caring for residents who die shared with Brian that when Joanne dies, I will cry. These letters have made me get to know her not as a resident, but as a person. So obviously this is a very touching and also heartbreaking story of a couple separated yet connected during uh, a very difficult time. But what I wanna focus on is the long-term care staff, the PSWs and the nurses who play a vital and essential role in safeguarding the relational connection between husband and wife. In placing these letters into a staff member's hands, Brian puts all of his trust as well. You can, you can feel this, the, this, this trust and this vulnerability in the opening line to his first letter. I hope the PSW has given you the flowers. And by sharing her own impressions about Joanne as a person directly with Brian, uh, as one PSW did, Brian knows that his wife was truly seen by other people. Uh, she is not alone. Uh, this will most surely be important to Brian in his grief if or when Joanne eventually dies. This second story comes from a published article in the December 2020 issue of The Gerontologist. It is the story of Esther and her wife, Kathy. Esther and Kathy were a couple for 33 years, and in that entire time, Esther's parents never once met Kathy. Esther explains that Kathy had a rare form of leukemia, and as she got sicker, they would be in and out of hospital. Esther would always fill out the required forms and would always tick the married box. This became a problem for the couple though, as Kathy got closer to end of life. So I'm now going to read uh, from, uh, from Esther's story. Kathy and Esther started noticing subtle changes with the way the nurse was interacting with them. The nurse came less frequently to their room and when he did, he spent noticeably less time in the room. The couple noticed that the nurse asked fewer questions than before, and the questions focused on medical needs rather than emotional ones. When the nurse did ask a question, very little eye contact was made, very little eye contact was made with Esther and Kathy. As Kathy got sicker, she noticed the nurse's demeanor becoming more overt and negative when Esther disclosed their relationship status and thus their sexual orientation. Kathy got anxious about how far this behavior would go and how it might influence the treatment and care she and Esther would receive. At the next appointment, Kathy told Esther, don't say anything about being married anymore. And so Esther started checking the box for emergency contact instead of spouse 
so that staff would think they were friends, not partners of 33 years. And when Kathy eventually died, Esther was known as her best friend, not her grieving spouse. So let's take a moment and come back to Brian and Joanne and remember how important it was that Brian be able to trust the healthcare staff in keeping Joanne connected to him. If Kathy and Esther had found themselves separated because of this pandemic, the way that Brian and Joanne were, would they have been able to trust their care providers in the same way? So the topic of today's session is caring for quote, populations at risk, which can mean many things. Um, I think that these two stories when read together can lead us into a critical reflection about risk. Different people based on their social location and relationships with wider structures and institutions are more likely or not to receive the type of care and support that they need when faced with a health challenge, including and perhaps especially during COVID-19. So as we think about how to engage nursing students in thinking about risk in the context of COVID-19, I think it's helpful to focus on three specific concepts, narrative, diversity, grief. Before we go any further, these are three points that are both my starting assumptions, but also my takeaway messages. So if, uh, if something goes wrong technologically and the call ends in the minute, these are the three points to take away. Stories are a fundamental source of learning for nursing and nursing education. Diversity should be the substance of our practice as nurses and nursing educators. We need to move beyond the discourse of special considerations. So what I mean by that is I find sometimes in nursing curricula, we kind of teach uh, a general, uh, we have a general kind of learning and then we add on almost as an appendix, you know, special considerations for LGBTQ people, special considerations for indigenous people, special considerations for structurally vulnerable people, et cetera. And um, I don't think that we should do that. I think that our curriculum should be filled uh, in every class and in every year and at every level uh, with stories uh, from people who reflect the true diversity of uh, the populations that we uh, care for. Um, today, when I speak about diversity, I'm going to be centering uh, the stories of queer people. Um, a note on language, I use the word queer freely. Um, I identify as a queer person and I find it a useful uh, term to kind of encompass the heterogeneity of uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered uh, and queer people. Um, but that word is a complicated one uh, with, a, with a painful history. Um, I don't use it lightly and I would encourage other people to also be mindful of when they choose or not to use that word. Um, but while I'm gonna be centering the stories of, uh, of queer people, I think that much of what I'm going to say has broad relevance for other communities who find themselves at the margins of our society. Um, and I also wanna be very clear that when I'm speaking about populations who are quote unquote at risk, I'm referring to a very specific kind of relationship between people and their context. More precisely, let's be clear that risk and vulnerability are circumstances that are imposed more onto certain people over others as a function of how power and privilege concentrate in our society and as a function of certain dominant social scripts about who is considered normal and who is considered deviant. Um, although the profession of nursing claims a commitment to advocacy and social justice as core values, um, and in many respects, we do that very well, um, such dominant assumptions about normality and deviance do routinely creep into our curriculums and into our practice. And we need to always be vigilant about that. Uh, oh, and uh, sorry, the uh, third uh, point um, uh, is about grief. And uh, grief is, uh, is the embodied response to loss. And I am going to suggest today that critical reflection about grief, um, our own and others, uh, can actually enhance our capacity to connect with and care for diverse populations. More on that later. So, I want to introduce you to Jane uh, Shulman. Uh, Jane Shulman is a, um, is a woman who 
uh, conducted a master's research project in cultural studies at the University of Winnipeg. She interviewed nursing educators and nurses, as well as queer people who had long-standing relationships with healthcare systems. Her thesis was titled Queering as a Verb, Nursing Pedagogy, Telling Stories, Inspiring Change. Um, on the basis of this work, Jane has delivered several workshops with nursing students and nursing faculty, including at the Canadian Nurses Students Association Conference in 2020. And that's where this little snippet on the slide comes from, a, a write-up by the students about Jane's workshop. Um, so this quote on the slide is from that write-up. Um, where they quote Jane as having taught them that the stories that queer people carry into medical encounters are a rich and underutilized resource for healthcare providers. Explore the challenges that queer people may face when they seek healthcare. Look at strategies that nurses can use to build on strengths, encourage storytelling, and create relationships of trust to provide the best care to queer patients. Um, Jane comes to this work from a personal place. She herself is a cancer survivor. And when she talks about her own experience of undergoing cancer treatment, she talks about, you know, never really connecting with the nurses that were caring for her because they never made it clear to her that she could be truly open and honest about who she was, about what her life looked like, about what her experience of cancer and cancer treatment uh, was, uh, what impact that was having on her, on her relationships, um, on, on her whole person. Um, and as she watched, you know, the patients around her interact with their nurses, she realized that, you know, there was a lot of relational care going on. There was a lot of, you know, asking about relationships, asking about, you know, psychosocial, social and spiritual impacts. Um, and, and she didn't really feel like she ever had access to, to any of that. Um, when, since, uh, when she's been doing this work of, uh, of engaging with nursing faculty and nursing students uh, about their care of LGBTQ people, she's noticed that when she does that work of engaging nursing audiences, one of, the, one of the lessons that she feels like students really kind of latch onto and, and take away is this idea that it's just so important to uh, refer to people by their correct pronouns. And, you know, I was talking with Jane earlier this week and we had a really interesting conversation about this because, you know, pronouns are so important. And, you know, if, if we're not going to be willing to, to address somebody by their correct pronouns, then we're really not gonna get very far at all in terms of our relationship with them. But they are a necessary, but not at all sufficient um, issue for ethical care with LGBTQ people. Um, the goal of this work should be to go deeper and to target other kinds of problems. The kinds of problems that result in a situation where over the course of an entire queer patient's cancer treatment, they never feel truly comfortable to be open and honest about who they are and the impact that cancer is having on their life. And I see this tension that Jane is highlighting as akin to the tension in nursing and nursing education between focusing on tasks and focusing on relationships. So yes, pronouns are important, uh, but they're a minimum. So like so many of the tasks that we do as nurses, um, it's, it, as I said, it's, it, it's necessary, but it's, but it's not at all uh, sufficient. Um, I spoke to Jane recently and I asked her, what is the main message of your work? What do you want nursing students and nursing faculty to know? And she said, people will not assume that they are safe to be who they are unless it's made explicitly clear to them that they can be. And in the absence of that, it's very hard to deliver ethical and equitable care. So, so as I said, let's move beyond the tasks and towards developing a relational tone with people where we are continuously expressing genuine curiosity about who they are, what matters to them, who are the people that matter to them, um, and how should we position ourselves in response. Um, she also cautions that it's important that we be soft on ourselves and we um, feel like it's okay to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. When you try to provide holistic care, you will make mistakes, Jane says, but the important thing is to try. So 
Obviously, there's been a lot of attention paid in the last year on seniors at risk uh, as an at risk population, and this is long overdue. Um, indeed, all seniors are vulnerable in COVID-19 uh, physiologically and socially. Less attention has been paid to particular groups of seniors who are exposed to different kinds of risks. And so I wanna focus on LGBTQ seniors who are um, more likely to be single and living alone, less likely to have children, more likely to be estranged from their biological families. Knowing this, um, I'm going to introduce you to a few stories that were told to us uh, through some focus groups that, um, that were collected as part of a research project that I am a, a part of. Um, so this is the HELP Ottawa study, which is a three-year participatory action research project in Ottawa. Um, engaging with different um, uh, faith communities and um, healthcare settings, uh, community healthcare settings and community groups um, around issues of um, uh, community and end of life care and loss and grief and, and trying to ultimately develop a community culture uh, where people's abilities to ask for and receive help at the end of life is strengthened. Um, the focus groups that I'm going to uh, talk about right now uh, come from, um, uh, from uh, conversations with members representing a senior pride network. So this is a community group that exists to support uh, the well-being of LGBTQ older adults. And in focus groups, we invited participants reflections about their experiences of supporting older LGBTQ2 plus people who are facing chronic or advanced illness, end of life or grief and loss. And we asked them, what kinds of things are important for someone from the outside to know? And a recurring theme in these focus group discussions was the idea of self-loathing, which, which is an internalized feeling of shame that some queer seniors experience and can impact their experiences at the end of life. This feeling starts early in life and continues into older adulthood. So as one of our participants stated, many of us are survivors of trauma. And I would say that life as a teenager, a queer teenager is an ongoing trauma. I mentioned at the start of uh, today's session that just this week, the Catholic Church declared that same-sex unions are not worthy of a church blessing. So I'm gonna be real with you. I heard that news uh, as I was preparing this very talk and I had to take a break. That news was yet another reminder that in many places and spaces around the world, including in this country, my own queer body and lifestyle is something to be judged and rejected. Being reminded of this as a queer person on a regular basis is frankly exhausting. The story that I wanna share in relation to this idea of self-loathing comes from one of our participants, a lesbian woman who spoke of participating in a circle of care for another lesbian woman uh, with metastatic cancer at the end of her life. This was a woman who was determined to have control over the end of her life and her care, who was thus very specific about what would and would not occur. For example, who was allowed to help her and who was not. What our participant took away from that experience of providing care for this other person was an appreciation for her determination and assertion of agency, something that she herself would not have seen herself capable of doing before that moment. So I'm gonna now read a quote from this participant. What I took from that is that everybody has a right to do that. And before that, before I was a part of that caregiving team, I didn't know that. I didn't think I was worthy of saying to somebody, no, actually, I don't want you to be in my room as I'm sick and throwing up. I want this person. But she was able to do that very, very clearly. And I learned really a lot from that whole session. I think this story creates a space for us to think about how to position nursing as a force to safeguard a sense of worthiness and dignity to people. This example is specific to an LGBTQ context, but it's transferable to other populations. For example, uh, Kelly Stajdahar, who leads a program of research uh, at the University of Victoria about palliative care for people who are structurally vulnerable. So by that, I mean people, for example, who live in poverty, who are homeless, who use drugs, maybe. 
Um, she writes uh, in a 2020 article called Provocations on Privilege in Palliative Care, quote, people positioned as structurally vulnerable are survivors. They must do so to keep going when they have nowhere to sleep, nothing to eat, and face discrimination at every turn. Dealing with chronic illnesses and isolation means good health is rarely attainable, yet structurally vulnerable people feel, and this is the important part, unworthy of care. Biases, both societal and from healthcare workers, tell them that they are undeserving. I'm now going to share three other ideas that emerged from our focus group discussions with these LGBTQ seniors um, that are more specific to the COVID pandemic and that tie into the histories and lived experience of LGBTQ people. So another question that recurred in our discussions was the following, where can I go that is safe? LGBTQ people are often othered through a dominant narrative that normalizes heterosexual and cisgender identities. This normalization is infused throughout our healthcare system, a system that, let's be clear, has never proven itself to be particularly welcoming or safe for queer people. Many queer people have therefore developed a healthy mistrust of the health and medical care establishment which is perhaps most vividly captured by the tensions that unfolded between the queer community and the healthcare establishment over the course of the AIDS pandemic. And so because of this general sense of health and medical care, uh, mistrust of health and medical care systems, queer people develop community oriented approaches of support. They do this out of sheer necessity. In other words, LGBTQ people look to one another to create safe spaces within illness because everyone else looks away. This is a quote from one of our participants. Because of past history within our community, people of our age who might become ill, the first thing that goes through our mind is the community itself, because it's always been the community who rallied. Especially during HIV AIDS, it was very often and probably the majority of times that their LGBTQ family were the ones they looked to, received all the support, resources, etc. So even now, if you have another pandemic that strikes, the first thing that most people would think of is, where do I go? Where can I go that is safe? So that is part of the history of looking towards our own community just out of necessity. That's still ingrained in a lot of people's minds. Our participants spoke about the fundamental importance of connection within the queer community and how facilitating spaces for queer people to come together is an ongoing project that helps people to connect with others, to work through past trauma, to live freely and fully in connection with self and with other people. Participants spoke about how the pandemic is interrupting this work. As one participant shared with us, I wouldn't be surprised to see within our community that people have started isolating again, almost subconsciously, using the pandemic as an excuse to isolate again. We've worked so hard with people, uh, with getting people out. We've all encountered people coming out to a dance for the first time in 30 years or coming out to pride for the first time and they're 80 years old. I can see this COVID lockdown just having such a negative impact on people and just sending them right back into that closet, even subconsciously. Lastly, I already mentioned that being queer means an ongoing vulnerability to trauma. Uh, nurses, educators, and students need to reckon with our legacy in having directly contributed to some of this trauma. One of our participants made a connection between his experience of living through the AIDS crisis and how those experiences are being activated now that COVID-19 is upon us. Um, so this is, uh, this is their quote. I can remember hauling, uh, hauling people off bedpans because they were left there by the nurses who would not enter the door. This pandemic currently, COVID-19, is bringing back a lot of really tough memories. And at that point, uh, the participant's voice cracked with emotion and other people in the group started to nod. They continued, I can remember picking up a guy's lunch from outside the room because people wouldn't open the door and take it to him. 
we had to also take on the medical community and teach them about gays, about gay families. I think I was probably involved in 60 to 100 deaths. So let's, let's reflect on that for a moment about accompanying members of one's own community through 60 to 100 deaths and the grief that that would provoke. I want us to, to pause there and switch gears to focus more specifically on grief and to think about the ways that grieving people, LGBTQ and otherwise, are themselves an at-risk population. So I actually view all grieving people as, as an at-risk population. And this is because while grief is a universal human experience, it is also hidden, minimized, and stigmatized in our society. Um, a lot of my thinking and work in this area uh, around grief is inspired by two uh, dear colleagues, Mary Ellen McDonald and Susan Cadell. Um, Mary Ellen McDonald is an anthropologist in the Faculty of Dentistry at McGill, and Susan Cadell is a professor of social work at uh, Renison University College at University of Waterloo. Um, I'm going to be referring to them quite a bit throughout the talk. Um, but this is a quote from one of Mary Ellen's recent pieces, uh, speaking about the, the very well rehearsed idea that death is taboo in our society. She says, there continues to be little public appetite for grief. Our responses to grief are not simply indifference either. We actually seem to be afraid of grief. This fear is perhaps intuitive. Grief is uncontrollable, uncontainable, messy. Social responses to a grieving person seem especially awkward when death uh, or whatever the loss might be controverts a normative master narrative or cultural script. So for example, the death of a child, um, medical assistance in dying, which I'm gonna be talking about later, any, any kind of death that, that controverts you know, master narratives or cultural scripts about how uh, things are supposed to be. If there is an important taboo to be addressed, it is a grief taboo, not a death taboo. Nora McInerney, uh, pictured here on the slide, has a TED talk uh, about grief. Um, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, I would encourage you to, to look it up and, and to watch it. She's actually quite funny, um, but her message is also profound. Um, and her main message is that we never move on from grief, uh, which is something that I will return to later. But for now, she, she talks about how, you know, bereaved people, you know, often come together, uh, for example, in, you know, social support groups. Um, there's this discourse that, you know, it really helps to talk to somebody who gets it. And she points out that that's not just because grieving people inherently gravitate towards each other. They are pushed towards each other by non-grieving people who, quote, hope that their sadness doesn't rub off on them. Uh, they don't want grieving people to get their sadness on other people. Um, and, so, and so they do. So, so bereaved people find each other uh, when you know, other people in their lives are maybe unwilling for them to, 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 to share their, their pain, their heartache, their, their grief. Um, and so Nora McInerney refers to kind of almost two worlds of people kind of existing side by side, but never quite meeting. The, the, the grief stricken and, uh, and people who she calls grief uh, adjacent, but not yet grief stricken. Uh, here is a quote from her. Most of the conversations that we have amongst ourselves um, they can and they will just stay amongst ourselves, but there are things that we talk about that the rest of the world, the world that is grief adjacent, but not yet grief stricken, could really benefit from hearing. The thing about COVID-19 though, is that we have all now become grief stricken. I, I asked all of you at the start of the talk to reflect on something that you have lost or are grieving. And I suspect that it wasn't hard for anybody here to, to, to think of something. Um, and so what I'm wondering is, is there potential for us to explore grief now that we have all landed in grief's territory with COVID-19 as a universal experience that connects us all in light of the universality of loss. Now, to be clear, that's not to be confused with universal losses. There's this idea that the pandemic is a great equalizer, that we're all in this together. Uh, and that's frankly BS. 
um, not all losses are the same. And as we've talked about, because of social positioning, some people are experiencing a whole heck of a lot more grief than other people. Um, but, I, but I do think that amidst that recognition of those differences, there still might be potential to tap into the universality of grief um, as a way to, to connect with one another. So let's think about teaching and learning in nursing as a space where we might share and reflect on stories of grief. And you know that would lead us to, well, whose stories would we should we focus on? Um, recently, I've found myself drawn to Krista Couture. Uh, she is indigenous, queer, disabled, a cancer survivor, and a bereaved parent. She speaks about how her identity cannot be abstracted away from any of these things, and yet she is also more than all of these things. Um, she lost her leg to cancer as a child. She lost one of her sons shortly after birth and another son 14 months after he was born. Um, she lost her partner after the deaths of her sons. So she is very familiar uh, with grief. She knows a lot about grief. Um, she currently lives with uh, her partner, Marsha and a daughter, Sona. And in an essay that Krista Couture uh, writes called These Are My Children, she talks about what goes through her mind every time somebody asks her um, if she has children. So I'm gonna read now from her essay. I couldn't guess how many times I've been asked if I have children or the similar related question, do you have other children? Each time I'm asked, I twitch or wince and I've yet to feel prepared for it. Each time I make a decision on how to answer, trying to gauge what the following questions would be, how the person I'm talking to might respond. I'm often making a quick judgment call on a person I barely know, guessing what their spiritual leaning might be, their openness to sorrow, where they land on the hug it out to suck it up spectrum. Whether saying yes feels like the right or wrong choice depends on how my own beliefs openness and access aligns or collides with theirs. So let's think more critically about this idea. To what extent do our beliefs, openness and access as nurses and as nursing students encourage the people and communities we care for to be their true selves with us, to trust us enough to reveal their vulnerability, their experience, their hopes, their grief. Um, I am currently uh, conducting interviews with bereaved people uh, who's, um, who have accompanied somebody through a medical assistance in dying. Um, these, these interviews are ongoing. I'm actually doing one tonight. Um, but I wanted to share one story um, of a daughter who spoke to us recently um, who for her mother to receive medical assistance in dying, uh, she did not want to receive it in the hospital because if she were to have received it in the hospital, she would have received it alone. Um, there would have been nobody able to be present. And so that obviously would have controverted uh, the idea that you know people who, who pursue MAID and, and indeed people more generally often would prefer to die surrounded by those who are important to them as, as illustrated here in this kind of somewhat romantic picture of a good death, uh, the picture there on the slide. So the workaround to that, uh, for her mother to be able to receive MAID during the pandemic but not to receive it in hospital, she had to receive it in the funeral home. So our participant talked to us about getting her mother dressed, helping her mother put on her shoes, helping her into the car, and driving her to the funeral home so that she could receive medication to end her life. And our participant is so clear with us that she is not against MAID, she supports MAID, she is happy that her mother was able to receive MAID. But her grief is so complicated over the fact that she had to participate in, uh, in getting her mother ready and driving her mother to her own death because the supports that should have been available in non-pandemic times strictly were not available. Um, so I think this story shows how grief experience is put at, at new levels of risk uh, in this era of COVID. 
Um, and certainly that's, that, that, that's a transferable idea to, to anybody who is experiencing end of life uh, and death uh, in the last year. Um, but importantly, our, participa our participant also talked to us about how she doesn't talk to anyone about her grief or about her mom. After her mom died, she told everybody, unless I bring it up, I don't want to talk about it. And the reason is because she does not trust people who are listening to her to listen properly. To her, this topic is so sacred that it opens her up to more harm to talk about it and then not feel listened to that she chooses not to talk about it at all. Um, also in this project, I, uh, we interviewed another, another person and, uh, and I just wanted to introduce you to her. So this is a woman uh, uh, who uh, lives with a disability that she has had since childhood. And so throughout her entire life um, as a youth and then also as an adult, it was always her and her mom. Um, and so obviously her mom's death has been profoundly significant for her. Um, her motivation to participate in our project was because she wants to help to contribute to changing the social narrative around medical assistance in dying. In her words, it's not taboo, it's nothing to be ashamed of. And her frame for thinking about MAID as taboo and something to be ashamed of is religion. So her mother worked in the Catholic church for a few years and when she was dying, she wanted the blessing of her Catholic priest who was in, in our participants words, like a son to her. Our participant said, quote, mom was very nervous about telling him what her plan was because she wanted him to do her service and it's a taboo thing in the Catholic church. So we sat down with him, the priest, and we told him and without hesitation, he said, well, I can't do a full Catholic, uh, a Catholic service, a Catholic church service, but I can certainly do something at the funeral home. Now our participant was pleased with that. She, she felt like that took a lot of weight off of her plate. Um, and uh, and you know, she was relieved because it had been so difficult for her mom to, to bring that up with the priest and she felt satisfied by the answer. But in listening to her tell us that story, I am brought back to the experiences of queer people who live uh, in communities and in families who feel this nervousness, who feel this dread that they are going to be rejected by the people who are important to them uh, because of their choices, because of their lifestyles. Um, and, and this insight, I think now we see translated into the made context um, where, you know, for people who are deeply religious and who need to feel the love of their religious and faith communities around them as they die, are vulnerable to not receiving that because of stigma around, uh, around MAID. Um, the reason that I have uh, a picture of a tattoo on this slide is um, this is this is a memorial tattoo. Um, this is a practice. Uh, many people will sometimes have tattoos uh, that are meant to signify a relationship with a person who has died. Um, and the participant that I just spoke about um, she had a tattoo on her arm during uh, our interview and my colleague, Susan Cadell, who I mentioned earlier, we, we do these interviews, uh, two researchers per participant. So we were together on the call. Um, and my colleague, Susan asked her, I see that tattoo on your arm. Is that by any chance a memorial tattoo? It was, and this led to further conversation about our participants grief, what her mom had meant to her and how she had captured this meaning in the art now displayed on her body. And I thought that was just such a lovely moment. You know, nursing students can do this. They, this, is, this can be a way to express that, uh, that curiosity that I talked about earlier about who, are, who the people are that we're caring for. Who are they? Who are the people that matter to them? Um, you know, I noticed that tattoo. What does that mean to you? Um, what I also love about memorial tattoos is their permanency. They feel like a rebuke of the discourse that grief is something to be overcome. And this discourse is apparent in nursing. And I'm coming to the end now of the talk, but one thing that I want to point out is that in the nursing literature about grief, grief is often considered a, a disorder, something that is amenable to intervention. 
And by definition, this idea of uh, you know, grief as disordered rests on a normative assumption that distinguishes between grief experiences that are appropriate and those that are problematic. But to come back to Krista Couture, when asked by a podcast interviewer, um, what is the best way to be in support of someone who is in grief? Um, what has been most helpful to you? What remains helpful to you? She answered, be close by without expecting an interaction. Presence without any kind of expectation. Grief is so exhausting, it's so isolating. Presence is really powerful. But if you're given your presence, you have to not have expectations about what this person that you are caring for uh, will, will achieve. You have to have an absolute acceptance of despair, an absolute acceptance of heartbreak, no silver linings. And in her memoir uh, released in 2020 titled How to Lose Everything, uh, she writes the following. I don't need my grief to disappear. I don't consider grief to be negative. I have cherished, still cherish, grief. Grief has slowly become integrated into my body and my art. Sometimes it still hurts enough that I gasp for air. Other times it moves into my chest as a wave and with my hand to my heart and a deep breath, I sway with it until the intensity passes. So what has the pandemic taught us about grief that can be used to propel our education and our nursing further in the directions of uh, social justice? Um, as I said, this pandemic is not the great equalizer. That's a dangerous myth, but it is true that loss, albeit to varying degrees, have been experienced universally. And to be clear, offering absolute acceptance of despair, as I just mentioned, at an individual level does not replace the need to intervene at the level of the social and the structural. In other words, we should be dual focused in our practice and in our teaching. Supporting individuals in grief by meeting them where they are and being willing to stay with them in their pain but coupled with collective action at a social level that challenges the status quo, that addresses unjust structures, policies, and systems that predispose certain communities to more grief in the first place. As eloquently stated by one of the participants in our Help Ottawa Focus Group study, we have a right to health and to care and to appropriate care. We shouldn't have to continually make volunteer organizations as the stopgap. And I think we have to start demanding, demanding treatment for people who are suffering because of whatever their situation is, but linked to being queer. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, we haven't actually had any questions um, submitted through the chat yet, but if people have got a Q&A that they'd like to submit, um we can stay on the line we've got it's just five to one at the moment we started a bit late so depending on people's availability etc we can go a little bit over time if need be not sure what your time constraints are david um Good. but a really really interesting presentation so i'll make assumptions that there may be people who are typing even as we speak about um what questions they may have and relation to your presentation. I'm just interested, I'm interested, I suppose, um, I'm thinking about, um, and certainly not my area, but thinking about my own students in my program who have a strong interest in trauma-informed care. Mm. But the lens, my impression of uh, the lens through which they view trauma-informed care is perhaps not as all encompassing as, as you're describing it, for example, when you referenced um, people who have been, you know, lived through the AIDS pandemic, et cetera, and are now going through a COVID pandemic. Are there ways that you've been able to, in your education, um, where your education had been able to help students to understand um, some, of the, some of the bigger, the bigger picture around trauma-informed care and how to help their clients and patients and families in that? I don't know if that question makes sense. Um. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I mean, I think that um, I think the trauma informed care is a, a very useful lens um, to th that students should be should be equipped with. 
um, it, it, it does provide um, a way to, to cue us into what certain people's life experiences may have been and how those may be impacting uh, their health experience uh, and or their experiences of care, you know, well uh, into, into the future. Um, but I, you know, my hesitation is like with so many things, I, I sometimes worry that, you know, students will kind of put themselves into the mindset of trauma-informed care and then think like, okay, well, I'm working with somebody who's experienced trauma. And so, you know, that's now the, the lens that I'm going to put on. That's the hat that I'm going to put on. And it, it, it kind of ties back a little bit to what I said before about diversity and, and how diversity should be the substance and not yeah. a special consideration. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that if we can think about how to invite our students to embody a relational ethic that is just universally always curious yes. about what somebody's life experiences have been and be sensitive to how those life experiences combine to form just such a complex picture of who they are right now and how they are experiencing what they're experiencing. Um, I think that moves us closer to what to, to what we're trying to achieve, you know. And, and this is why I why I, I I chose to showcase the 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 stories of Krista Couture because I think you know as somebody who is you know disabled and queer and indigenous and bereaved, um, you know none of her stories about any one of those things can be abstracted away from her experience yeah. of being those other things at the same time. Yeah. Um, so I, I think we need to be encouraging our students to engage with people in all of their complexity, yeah. um, you know, uh, including their histories of trauma, but also not reducing them to their stories of trauma. You know, part of my tension around presenting some of this work around what LGBTQ seniors told us is I don't want to contribute to a narrative that suggests that you know, LGBTQ people are just, you know, living their lives traumatized from AIDS and, and they don't live rich, meaningful, satisfying, yeah. wonderfully fabulous lives, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and our students need to need to be able to appreciate those those tensions and those contradictions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I do feel like sometimes my students kind of do comp compartmentalize that trauma informed care piece. And we tend to do it to be fair in the curriculum too, you know, well, here's the trauma informed care section for you to now uh, think mm. about, but um, without embedding it across everything. Um, comments in the um, chat, David, around uh, thanking you and for giving people the opportunity to reflect and not be upset with our grief, but to embrace it from Kate um, and uh, Charlene, that thought it was a fantastic presentation, and Amy. Uh, do you have any thoughts regarding continuing education approaches around what you've discussed? I'm thinking of comments that colleagues might make and assumptions that are made as people harden as they become more experienced nurses. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a tough one. Um, I Continuing education is is such a it's such a complicated, it, continuing education is a fraught concept for me because, you know, as somebody who, who works in, in the Academy of Nursing, I, I am often witness to, you know, educational interventions which, that will purport to kind of, you know, go into communities where nurses are doing the work and, and try to package education. And then, you know, we have this idea that like, okay, if you, you know, if we add education and stir, nursing practice will improve. Um, and I think that our continuing education approaches need to be flipped. I, I think that they need to begin from an assumption that nurses in practice, the, the nurses who are doing the work, the nurses who are up close to these stories, um, actually already hold all of the wisdom that they need uh, to be able to achieve whatever ethical care uh, that, we are, that we are aspiring towards. Um, I, I think that, you know, what Amy is suggesting here that as people harden, um, as people become morally distressed, um, as, as nurses themselves uh, go through their own traumas and then potentially respond to that by, by maybe disengaging a little bit from, from what their core values actually are. Um, you know, I think that needs to be the, the target and the focus of what we would call continuing education. So, so I think our role in, in continuing education isn't necessarily like, 
oh, here's the, here's the latest, greatest, you know, paper that was just published, or here's the next best, you know, uh, tool that you might want to implement in your practice. But can we create a space, uh, a, a space for us to reflect, uh, a space for us to share stories um, about how those impacted us? Um, and, and what can we learn from those stories? You know, much as how I've, how, how I've designed today. Yes. Um, and I think that continuing education in nursing needs to be something that is valued and remunerated at all levels, right? So, I mean, I don't know who's joining this call right now, who's being paid for that time, who's having to do it on a break, who's having to do it on a day off. Um, but, you know, this, this relational stuff can't be the fluffy extra uh, stuff of nursing. Um, it's, it relates back to what I said before about tasks and relationships. Yes. Um, that, you know, we need to we need to recenter what it ultimately is that we're all about. Value that in terms of resources, and and I think that that gets us. It might get us somewhere uh, yeah. with respect to what Amy is concerned about. Thanks, thanks, Gavin. Uh, and Nick had a comment um, uh, describing it as a beautiful presentation, and they were very moved such an important topic and considerations for nursing education. Your comment about uh, curiosity of person resonated with them, so thank you. Great. I'm not seeing any more, oh, that's a one new message, even as we speak. Uh, I think this might be from a follow-up from Nick. How are nursing organisations policy addressing and supporting LGBTQ2S plus in long-term care, how do you change the culture? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I think, you know, incrementally, <laughs> one, <laughs> one, bit, one bit at a time. Uh, you know, I, I think the first thing is to recognize what the problem is. Um, I, I think it is widely documented in research that, um, that seniors in, in care facilities often retreat into this metaphorical closet um, after having lived, uh, you know, uh, an out life as a, a as a queer person, and and recognizing why that is happening um, is 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 key to to addressing that problem. Um, in the in the hospice that I work at, uh, we all uh, wear, you know, we have our lanyard with our with our name tag, but the lanyard is actually a, a rainbow. Uh, and we have a plastic card that uh, specifies our pronouns and that then on the flip side of the card, it, uh, it's a question and it's basically asking, you know, what are your pronouns? Um, and, you know, what I said before about how pronouns are a, a basic minimum, you know, mm. is, is still true. But I do think that there's something very powerful about the fact that every single staff member in this facility, 24 hours a day, is displaying an affirmation of queer identity. And, and any queer person will recognize that when you are asking about pronouns, you, you, you get it at least in part, right? Yeah. Um, so, so it's an opening. And, right. um, and so I, you know, that on its own will not completely change the culture, but, uh, but right. it's a start. All right, thank you. I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Nick. Uh, not seeing any more comments in the chat, and given we're five past the hour, I think we might um, bring it to a close, if that's okay with you, Dr. Wright. And uh, thank you to you again, and to everyone who participated today. And please note that the recording of this session will be made available on CASM's YouTube channel and circulated to you as participants in the coming days. And please feel free to share the link with your networks. Thank you again, everyone, and Kazan certainly hopes you will consider attending future Lunch and Learns. And while this year's series has now come to completion, we do encourage you to visit kazan.ca, search for the Lunch and Learn uh, site later this summer for more information on the 2021-2022 uh, series. So thanks again, everybody, and David, a special thanks to you for taking the time for such a fabulous presentation. And all the best for the rest of the week, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye.